Hello friends and welcome back to the Today Machine channel. In this video, we will explore the entire process from iron ore mining to steel production and steel structure fabrication to erect giant steel structures at extremely dangerous heights. The journey of American mining and steel making begins on Minnesota's Iron Range, home to the unique Masabi Formation an iron-bearing geological formation deposited approximately 1.8 billion years ago. Before mining operations can commence, an extensive environmental review process is mandatory. This involves obtaining an environmental impact statement, ICE, and mining permits from the government. The ICE is a comprehensive review that assesses the potential impacts of the mining activities on the environment, human health, and the economy in Minnesota. This process includes scientific and economic impact studies, environmental sampling, and public meetings for community input. The mining permits incorporate the findings of the ICE and set forth operational requirements to ensure compliance. A critical part of the permitting process is the commitment to mine land reclamation. This phase ensures that disturbed areas are returned to a natural state, either during or shortly after mining operations. Reclamation involves reshaping the land into hills, grasslands, forests, and lakes, benefiting future generations. The pits left by iron mining often become lakes stocked with fish and can feature residential developments, cabins, resorts, or public lands along their shorelines. Once all permits, restoration plans, and financial assurances are secured, mining can begin. The iron-bearing rock in this region, known as taconite, is extremely hard and contains around 30% iron. Using explosives, the taconite is blasted into manageable chunks, which are then loaded into large haul trucks by giant excavators. These trucks, capable of carrying up to 240 tons of rock, transport the iron ore to processing plants and the overburden to stockpiles. At the processing plant, the taconite undergoes a series of crushing processes until it is reduced to the size of marbles or smaller. This crushed rock is then mixed with water and ground into a fine powder in rotating mills. The iron-bearing mineral, magnetite, is separated from the non-magnetic waste rock using magnetic separation techniques. The remaining waste rock, called tailings, is stored in large basins. The magnetite concentrate, now upgraded to higher iron content and the consistency of fine sand, may undergo a flotation process to further purify the iron from unwanted materials like silica. This process involves placing the concentrate slurry in vats that froth or foam, allowing the higher concentrate iron to be separated by vacuums, resulting in a drier, iron-rich substance. The concentrate is then mixed with clay and rolled into marble-sized balls in large rotating cylinders, similar to making snowballs. These balls are heated until red-hot, hardening as they cool. The final product is iron ore pellets containing 65% iron, designed for efficient melting in blast furnaces. These iron pellets are transported by rail to ore docks on Lake Superior's shore, where they are loaded onto Laker ships. These ships navigate the Great Lakes to steel-making towns such as Gary, Indiana, and Cleveland, Ohio. There, the pellets are melted in blast furnaces to produce the steel used in the countless products integral to our daily lives. Iron ore from the Hercules mines in the Coahuila Desert is transported as a slurry through a 14-inch diameter, 180-mile-long pipeline to the pelletizing plant. Upon arrival, the slurry is filtered to recover water, and the dry ore is then sent to pelletizer discs. Here, it is mixed with binding agents to form small balls called pellets. These pellets are heat-hardened at 1,300 degrees Celsius before being sent to blast furnaces. Coal processing. Metallurgical coal, transported by rail from the Carboniferous region of Coahuila, is treated in vertical ovens lined with refractory brick. Through an 18-hour baking process, the coal is transformed into coke, 
the basic fuel for blast furnaces that produce pig iron. This coking process also produces valuable byproducts like coke oven gas, which is used in later stages of steelmaking. Sintering. Sintering is another critical process that prepares raw materials for the blast furnace. A porous mass composed of iron ore flakes and powder, blended with lime, coke fines, and dolomite, is hardened in a continuous chain oven. This mass, known as sinter, along with pellets and coke, serves as a primary input for the blast furnaces. Blast Furnace Operation The blast furnaces at Acero are large cylindrical structures, over 160 feet high, lined with refractory brick. They are designed to convert the iron oxides in the pellets and sinter into pig iron. Charging the furnace Raw materials such as pellets, sinter, limestone, dolomite, and coke are stored in hoppers and deposited into the blast furnaces through a charging system located at the top. Smelting. Hot air, introduced under pressure at the furnace's bottom, blasts the coke and smelts the iron ore at temperatures up to 1,650 degrees Celsius. The molten metal collects in a graphite hearth at the furnace's base and is then drained through tap holes into 200 metric ton capacity torpedo cars. Desulfurization. The molten pig iron undergoes desulfurization, where reagents like calcium carbide and magnesium are added to reduce sulfur content. The resulting slag is cooled with water, stored, or sold as a byproduct. Steel making processes. Acero employs two primary methods for converting pig iron into steel the basic oxygen furnace, BOF, and the electric arc furnace, EAF. Basic Oxygen Furnace, BOF, scrap metal is first loaded into pear-shaped refractory-lined converters with capacities of up to 150 metric tons. Molten pig iron is then added, and oxygen, argon, and nitrogen are injected into the mix under pressure through lances. This process refines the metal into liquid steel in about 45 minutes. Ferroalloys are added to adjust the steel's chemical composition as per client specifications. Electric Arc Furnace, EAF. The EAF process begins with a mixture of scrap metal, iron briquettes, or liquid pig iron, typically at 150 metric tons per cast. The furnace uses three graphite electrodes to apply 140 megawatts of electric energy, melting the load to produce steel. The liquid steel is then transferred into special ladles. Secondary Treatment. Liquid steel from both the BOF and EAF processes undergoes secondary treatment to achieve specific properties. This involves secondary metallurgy, ladle metallurgy or chemical reheating, dual degassing, reducing hydrogen and carbon content for higher quality applications. Once the steel undergoes secondary treatment for refining, it is directed to the continuous casting machines. Liquid steel is poured from a ladle into a tun dish which serves as a reservoir, maintaining a steady flow of steel to the mold below. The steel enters a water-cooled copper mold where it begins to solidify. The outer shell forms quickly due to rapid cooling, while the inner core remains molten. As the partially solidified steel exits the mold, it is supported by a series of rollers. The strand is carefully withdrawn and straightened while being continuously cooled with water sprays. Complete solidification occurs as the strand moves through the secondary cooling zone. Once fully solidified, the continuous slab is cut to the desired length using oxy-fuel torches. This process results in slabs of uniform thickness and quality, ready for further processing in the hot rolling mill. Rolling and finishing. Hot rolling. The hot rolling department, considered the backbone of the Compne operations, processes the slabs in two main lines, plate lines, reheat slabs to 1,330 degrees Celsius and use reversing mills to generate plates in the desired thickness and width. Hot strip line. 
Slabs are reduced in the universal reversing mill to a thickness of 2 inches and further reduced to 1 inch on the finishing mill. The final thickness is achieved on a 6-stand finishing mill train. The hot rolled coil is either shipped directly to customers or sent to the cold rolling departments for further processing. Cold rolling. The cold rolling process reduces the sheet's thickness and enhances its physical properties. After pickling to remove oxides, the strip is cooled to room temperature and passed through various mills. Annealing in continuous heating ovens softens the material and tempering mills improve surface quality and hardness. The mill also operates skin pass and tension leveling lines for hot rolled and cold rolled coils, ensuring uniform thickness and surface quality. Specialty Products the mill produces specialty products like tin plate and tin free steel for metal container manufacturing. These products involve cold rolled coils subjected to electrolyte baths with tin and chrome, respectively. Structural shapes. This mill is a primary domestic manufacturer of structural steel for the construction industry. This involves cutting slabs into blooms, reheating them, and rolling them into structural shapes like W shapes, C shapes, and angled L shapes. The fabrication of H-beams begins with cutting steel plates to the required dimensions. High-precision cutting methods, such as CNC plasma cutting, laser cutting, or oxy-fuel cutting, are employed to ensure accurate dimensions and clean edges. The cutting process is crucial as it determines the final dimensions and quality of the H-beams. The plates are typically made from high-strength structural steel, chosen for its excellent mechanical properties and durability. Assembling plates into an H shape. Once the steel plates are cut, they are assembled into the characteristic H shape. This assembly process involves positioning two flange plates and one web plate. The web plate is placed vertically between the two horizontal flange plates. Alignment is critical at this stage to ensure the structural integrity and load bearing capacity of the final H beam. Fixtures and clamps are used to hold the plates in position while they are being assembled. Automated assembly lines can streamline this process, ensuring precision and efficiency. H-beam welding. After the plates are correctly positioned and clamped, the welding process begins. The most common welding methods for H-beam fabrication are submerged arc welding, saw, and gas metal arc welding, GMAW. These methods are chosen for their ability to produce strong, consistent welds. Tack Welding. Initially, tack welds are applied at strategic points along the plates to hold them together. This prevents any movement during the main welding process. Main Welding. The main welding process involves running continuous welds along the joints where the web plate meets the flange plates. Automated welding machines equipped with multiple welding heads are often used to perform this task efficiently. These machines ensure consistent weld quality and speed up the fabrication process. Post welding. After welding, the H beams undergo inspection to check for any defects or inconsistencies in the welds. Non destructive testing methods, such as ultrasonic testing, may be employed to ensure the welds meet the required standards. The manufacturing process for steel structures in shipyards involves several key stages to ensure high quality and on-time delivery. Initially, the concept and design phases are integrated closely with production to optimize material use, weight, and required operational standards. This two-way process facilitates finding optimal solutions for each project. Once the design is finalized, production takes place in modern, custom-built facilities designed for controlled indoor conditions essential for tasks like blasting and painting. Pre-treated materials are used to enhance durability and quality. Professional staff, equipped with special skills and regularly trained, oversee the manufacturing process, ensuring adherence to technical specifications and standards. Quality control is rigorous, with experienced supervisors and controllers permanently stationed at partner plants. 
Each production stage is documented, with control reports and measurement protocols submitted to maintain transparency and compliance with customer requirements. The final products are inspected and approved by classification societies. Logistics play a crucial role in ensuring on-time deliveries. Proven global logistics partners handle the safe transport of cargo, which is surveyed and insured before shipment. The Oz 30 Series 4 Roll Hydraulic Plate Rolling Machines, 3100 mm, are renowned for providing reliable and excellent solutions for precise and challenging rolling applications. These machines are an optimal choice for bending materials with a plate thickness ranging from 2 mm to 200 mm and a plate width from 500 mm to 12,000 mm. The design of the four roll Oz models aims to minimize flat ends at a single pass, enabling workshops to achieve full cylinders efficiently. This feature significantly enhances the efficiency and productivity of rolling operations, making these machines indispensable in various industrial applications. A standout feature of the Oz 4 roll machines is their ability to pinch the material with the bottom roll during both pre-bending and bending processes. This allows for precise pinching of the plate between the top and bottom rolls, significantly reducing the length of flat ends. The inclusion of superior four-roll CNC rolling machines decreases dependency on operators and offers more reliable and productive solutions. These machines typically consist of one idler roll positioned on top and three moving rolls that use mechanical and hydraulic power to roll metal plates. They are instrumental in workshops worldwide, transforming metal plates into cones, cylinders, and arcs for various large metal structures with circular or round shapes. The working mechanism of a four-roll plate rolling machine is straightforward yet highly efficient. Initially, the metal plate is fed between the top and bottom rolls of the machine. Subsequently, the right bottom roll moves down, creating space for the metal plate to pass through, while the left bottom roll moves up, causing the metal plate to roll due to the pressure exerted by the idler roll on top. This rolling process continues until the metal plate forms a cylindrical structure. Depending on the job requirements, the plate can be rolled to different angles and diameters, offering great flexibility in production. One significant advantage of the four-roll bending machine is its time-saving capability. It allows operators to pre-bend and roll the end in half the time compared to a three-roll plate rolling machine, making it a highly efficient option for any workshop. The ease of operation is another notable benefit. Equipped with a secure sheet clamping mechanism, the machine provides continuous support throughout the rolling process, enabling even novice operators to achieve precise pre-bending and tapering functions akin to seasoned professionals. Higher efficiency is another key benefit of the four-roll plate rolling machine. The ability to perform pre-bending results in a small straight edge less than 1.5 times the thickness of the metal plate. This efficiency allows production to be completed in half the time compared to a three-roll plate rolling machine, achieving the flattest end possible. Additionally, the four-roll plate rolling machine ensures higher accuracy in the
The global structural steel fabrication industry has seen significant growth over the past few decades, driven by increasing infrastructure development, urbanization, and industrialization. Structural steel fabrication involves the cutting, bending, and assembling of steel to create various structures, such as buildings, bridges, and industrial plants. This industry is crucial for modern construction and has been evolving with advancements in technology and processes. Market size and growth. As of 2023, the global structural steel fabrication market was valued at approximately $160 billion. The market is expected to grow at a compound annual growth rate, CAGR, of 4.5% from 2023 to 2030, reaching around $215 billion by 2030. This growth is fueled by increasing demand for steel structures in residential, commercial, and industrial sectors. Regional Insights Asia-Pacific This region dominates the global market, accounting for over 45% of the total market share in 2023. Rapid urbanization and industrialization in countries like China and India drive the demand for structural steel fabrication. China's Belt and Road Initiative, which includes massive infrastructure projects across Asia, Africa, and Europe, further boosts the market. North America the North American market holds a significant share, with the United States leading the way. The U.S. market benefits from a robust construction industry, extensive infrastructure projects, and a focus on sustainable building practices. In 2023, North America accounted for about 25% of the global market. Europe. Europe also plays a crucial role in the structural steel fabrication market, with Germany, the UK, and France being key contributors. The European market focuses on modernizing existing infrastructure and developing smart cities, contributing to steady market growth. Europe represented approximately 20% of the global market in 2023. Technological Advancements. Technological innovations are transforming the structural steel fabrication industry. Computer numerical control, CNC, machines, automated welding systems, and advanced robotics are enhancing precision and efficiency. Building Information Modeling, BIM. Software is increasingly used for design and project management, improving collaboration and reducing errors. For instance, CNC machines have revolutionized the industry by enabling precise cutting and shaping of steel components. Automated welding systems have significantly improved the speed and quality of welds, reducing labor costs and enhancing structural integrity. BIM software allows for detailed 3D modeling of structures, facilitating better project planning and execution. Challenges and opportunities. Despite the positive outlook, the industry faces challenges such as fluctuating steel prices, skilled labor shortages, and environmental concerns. Steel prices are influenced by global supply and demand dynamics, geopolitical tensions, and trade policies, which can impact profitability. The industry is also grappling with a shortage of skilled labor, particularly in advanced fabrication techniques and automation. Investing in workforce training and development is essential to address this issue. Environmental concerns are pushing the industry towards sustainable practices. 
The adoption of green building standards and the use of recycled steel are becoming more prevalent. Companies are exploring energy-efficient production processes and reducing waste to minimize their environmental footprint. The erection of steel beams and structural steel components, especially when conducted at height, poses significant risks and dangers that necessitate stringent safety measures. This process, integral to the construction of skyscrapers, bridges, and large industrial structures, involves hoisting, placing, and securing large, heavy steel beams often tens or even hundreds of feet above the ground. The inherent dangers of this work stem from the combination of the height, the weight of the materials, and the complexity of the tasks involved. Risk Factors Height and Fall Risks One of the most significant dangers in steel erection is the risk of falls. According to the Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, Falls are the leading cause of fatalities in the construction industry, accounting for 36.4% of all construction deaths. Workers can be positioned anywhere from a few feet to several hundred feet above the ground. For instance, erecting steel beams for a 20-story building involves working at heights of approximately 200 feet. The risk of fatality increases significantly with height. A fall from 20 feet has a 30% chance of being fatal, which increases to nearly 100% at heights above 80 feet. Heavy materials. Steel beams used in construction are incredibly heavy. A single steel I-beam, measuring 30 feet in length, can weigh upwards of 1,500 pounds, 680 kilogram. Lifting and positioning such heavy components require precise coordination and powerful machinery like cranes. Mishandling or equipment failure can lead to beams falling, which can be catastrophic not only for the workers but also for anyone below. Weather conditions. Working at heights exposes workers to varying weather conditions, including high winds, rain, and extreme temperatures. High winds, for example, can make handling large beams particularly dangerous, as gusts can cause swaying and instability. The Beaufort wind scale indicates that winds of just 25 to 31 miles per hour, moderate gale, can cause difficulty in walking against the wind and would severely complicate the handling of materials suspended by cranes. Safety measures. Fall protection systems. OSHA mandates that fall protection must be provided at elevations of 6 feet in the construction industry. This includes personal fall arrest systems, PFAs, guardrails, and safety nets. PFAs, which consist of a harness, lanyard, and anchor point, can arrest a fall within 6 feet and prevent a worker from hitting the ground. Proper training. Workers involved in steel erection must receive comprehensive training. This includes not only how to use safety equipment but also how to recognize hazards, use tools and equipment correctly, and perform tasks safely. The OSHA 10-hour and 30-hour training courses are designed to teach workers the basics of construction safety, while specialized training focuses on the specifics of steel erection. Use of cranes and rigging. The lifting and placement of steel beams require the use of cranes and rigging equipment. Crane operators and riggers must be certified and trained to handle the heavy loads and the dynamics of moving steel beams at height. Properly maintained and inspected equipment is crucial, as a single failure in the rigging can lead to catastrophic consequences. Weather monitoring. To mitigate the risks associated with adverse weather conditions, Continuous monitoring of weather forecasts and conditions is essential.
Wind speeds, in particular, should be closely monitored, and work should be halted if winds exceed safe limits. For example, the American National Standards Institute ANSI, recommends ceasing crane operations if wind speeds exceed 20 miles per hour for regular lifts and 30 miles per hour for critical lifts. Emergency preparedness. Having a clear emergency plan is vital. This includes rescue plans for workers who may fall and be suspended by their harnesses, first aid training for all workers, and ensuring that emergency services can be promptly contacted and access the site. 